Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm uh, going to welcome you to Green Futures 2023. Um, my name is Simon Fisher, um, an FU Environment Advisor for the East Midlands region, and I'll be uh, chairing this first webinar in the series of uh, two this year. Um, before I outline the agenda today uh, and give everybody time to catch up and join the call, we're steadily building up numbers. Um, I'll outline a couple of housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is going to run till um, 2.20 when I'll draw it to a close. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end of our presentations. Um, if you have personal questions to ask, um, then the, use, please use the Q&A button function, uh, not the chat one. Um, and uh, we'll try and cover as many of the questions as possible um, in the Q&A. Um, there are basis points available today. Um, we don't appear to have Neuroso points available. That's primarily because Neuroso is, is between uh, administrators at the moment. It's coming from going across from city and guilds um, into basis, and they're not quite up and running yet. So what we propose to do is uh, those who attend, the, we'll send the link to those who have attended these events um, so that they can use it with their online account. Uh, and last housekeeping point relates to uh, the second webinar, which is in a week's time on the 31st of January. Um, if you're already registered, then you will um, start to see the link for that later this week. Uh, that event's going to be looking at um, getting you up to speed on Elms in 2023, uh, and it's already um, well subscribed. So um, this afternoon's webinar is based on the title of uh, Water, Save and Protect. Um, you will have all heard in recent months um, that water is fairly high on the political agenda. Um, the water companies are under the spotlight on um, wastewater in rivers. So too is agriculture in terms of its diffuse um, nutrient runoff issues. Um, the Environment Agency has seen an increase in funding that, were, that, so it, that can employ up to 50 new farm inspectors uh, who will be targeted at um, high risk river catchments. Um, and enforcement is also backed up though by helpful advice and DEFRA have almost doubled the funding for catchment sensitive farming program to tackle water pollution from farming. Um, in December, uh, DEFRA announced a water quality target to reduce nitrogen, um, phosphorus and sediment pollution from agriculture into the water environment by at least 40% by 2038. Um, in pulling together the seminar today, the organisations involved in Green Futures in the East Midlands um, wanted to offer useful guidance to your businesses uh, and have a programme from webinar one that will inform you on what you can expect from an inspection for, uh, for from the Environment Agency, that'll be Graham Dixie, um, what water companies um, can give to farmers to help improve the quality of water they, they extract, so Chris Hewis from Angling Water and Dr Adam Freer from Seven Trent. And Bob Marsden will um, come with the fourth presentation this afternoon. Um, he heads up catchment sensitive farming in the East Midlands and will we'll be able to help outline the help that they can give. Um, each presenter will hand over to their next colleague in the four presentations covered in the next hour. And then it'll be back to me for questions and answers. So now I'd like to hand over please to Graham Dixie from the Environment Agency. Graham, over to you. Thank you there, Simon. A uh, warm welcome to everybody this afternoon. Nice sunny day for a change, hopefully, for everybody. Um, today, we want to talk about, sorry, my camera's not on, uh, talk about um, how you can prepare for a typical planned uh, EA farm inspection, such as one that might um, take into account a catchment campaign that we're doing to tackle local water quality or something to do with land management issues in a certain patch. So. What we're not going to talk about uh, those other situations that we don't spend so much time um, on as compared to the catchment campaign, such as things like uh, tackling uh, water pollutions, for example, or following up complaints. So I'm only talking about those planned uh, inspections today. So just, just quickly moving on to the next slide, I just want to quickly um, explain um, the areas that Caroline and myself cover. Um, East Midlands Environment Agency is a catchment water boundary area, not East Midlands political boundary, just to make that clear. Um, and that's the left hand side of the area in the map outlined in red. And to the right is Caroline's area, which is mainly Lincolnshire, North Hants. Most of my patches, Leicestershire, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. OK, next slide, please. 
So who might visit you and, and why? So it, we've got two, um, two ways of doing this now, um, but we're doing it only with good reason. So the first more traditional route is with the local environment officers who are environment agency staff, um, full paid up members. So local evidence led risk-based catchment campaigns and also any follow-up to pollution incidents. What we also have now since um, the end of September 21 um, are our DEFRA funded agriculture regulations inspection officer colleagues, such as Caroline, who's also on the line. They are um, looking primarily at catchments draining into water dependent um, nutrient neutrality or Natura 2000 sites or protected areas impacted by dairy and livestock farming, such as sites of special scientific interest or, or chalk streams. Um, one thing I just want to point out, we are principally a regulator who gives advice where we can. Uh, we want farmers to be compliant and have successful businesses. Um, there are obviously lots of benefits with that, more efficient farming, better returns, less risk, and improve local environment. So um, we'll normally choose wherever possible to give advice and guidance in the first instance to help you guys uh, bring your back business back into compliance if there are any issues that we're, we're aware of. So moving on to the next slide. This is a little diagram pulled together, hopefully it sort of illustrates maybe um, in a hypothet hypothetical catchment, an example, how we might go about forming one of these catchment campaigns and how we get around to get in touch with you guys. So start at the top left at the start. So we've got the, the evidence collection analysis sort of section really. So in this example, uh, we may be collecting monthly water samples and find issues with uh, elevated phosphate and sediment levels in, in the water course. And we notice that they're sort of slowly going up. So what we'll do, we'll gather our data and any other evidence we can. Um, from aerial photography, satellite images, uh, walkovers by staff or using drones. And what we tend to then do is we look at all the inputs into the catchment. And in this case, because there are no uh, hypothetical sewage treatment works, we can identify that one of the main issues is looking like livestock. So moving on to the right hand picture, we can then layer up lots of different bits of data in map form and look at high risk areas. And this one, for example, shows um, bare ground, uh, some sort of risky crops on high uh, steep slopes, such as maize and also overland flow paths into water courses. Moving down to the right, we've again got some drone footage, for example, here with a poaching, which all adds um, good information. What we do, we distill all that into um, some of our data analysis uh, machinery and what we end to tend up tend to end up with is a risk-based farm inspection list. So we've used all those suites of factors such as livestock density, proximity to river, high risk activities and previous inspections. Um, this allows us to then rank those farms that we need to go to see first and also even maybe those that we don't need to see at all. And the final thing then we do at the finish is actually get in touch with you guys by telephone or by letter. So moving on to the next slide, what we're likely to talk about, just a couple of quick points. Firstly, we're not trying to catch you out when we, we, when we call you. We really do want to understand what you're doing and have a, a, a good discussion about that. The second point to note is that we are empathetic to farmers and landowners and do recognise that land can be difficult for some of us, uh, especially at the moment. So we do want to help where we can and not hinder. So the sort of things we'll ask is, is to confirm we've got the right contact details, CPH number, SBI number, et cetera. Um, discuss why we're getting in touch with you. And that might be because of the poor river water quality, as in the hypothetical example earlier. Uh, we'll then have a chat about what your current farming practices are, whether you're a dairy, mixed or arable farm, uh, whether you're an owner or a tenant. Uh, we'll then have a chat about your general awareness, environmental regulations, and where that, all that sits with the basic payment scheme. And then ultimately, at the end of that, we'll agree, agree a convenient time and date to come and visit you. And, uh, and to let you know, we'll put it all 
as plainly as possible in a written letter, which I'll now talk about on the next slide. So what you'll receive in the post or by email, firstly, there'll be a, a bespoke cover letter. So this confirms the inspection as discussed on the phone. We'll confirm the reasons why we're coming and we'll provide a checklist um, of what rules and regulations we'll check. This is really, really hope, helpful for you, I think, you guys. Um, help you prepare before we come. So we'll be looking for you to pull things together about your yard drainage, if that's applicable. MVZ records, if you're in MVZ area. Um, soil samples and your nutrient management plans, whether you've got any water abstraction uh, figures available if you do have an abstraction license, risk maps, that sort of thing. Um, and that will all be set out quite plainly in this letter, as you can see. And if we move on to the next slide, we can have a look at that in a bit more detail. So as you can see here, there's reasons for our visit. And in this case, it's to do with preventing diffuse pollution and nutrient enrichment. And we've identified 40% of the, the problem maybe coming from livestock farms. And also then we'll talk about what happens when we actually do the farm visit and who we can signpost you to if, uh, if we do find areas that need improvement and there may be grants available, for example. And also talk about any non-compliances we found and put some advice together and some suitable timetables. So moving on to the next slide, the really important, useful bit is the um, generic checklist. Um, it is a movable feast though, so we can adapt it depending on the catchment and the customer. So in this case, I've selected silage soil and agricultural fuel or regs to cover um, any slurry storage or silage um, clamps and general agricultural fuel storage. Also the farming rules for water rules and some general pollution prevention and uh, waste exemption uh, information. So in theory, this site's not an MVZ, hence we don't need to put that in. Uh, there's also a little um, Little reminder at the bottom, declaration about a uh, basic payment scheme. So moving on to the next slide, uh, we may also uh, throw some other free goodies into the letter as well. Uh, for example, here on the left, you've got the farming rules for water cab cards, which gives, gives you an idea of the eight uh, rules that all farmers need to comply with. Uh, there may be some pollution prevention guidance, such as the AdBlue PPG there at the back. Um, and also um, something that we've been using locally in the River Wye and Lathkill uh, catchment is a, a really quite informative, useful leaflet explaining the issues that we're finding, um, where agriculture fits into that and who else we might be, other industries we might be also uh, going to talk to. So once we've got all that, moving on to the next uh, slide is the actual inspection itself. I could talk for hours for this. I know you won't want me to, and I haven't got time anyway. Um, but the inspections generally, they're going to last between about an hour and a half to maximum five hours. Um, it all depends really on the, the size of your operation, how complex it is, the advice we actually need to provide um, when we're looking at paperwork, your yards, your fields, if you've got water courses as well, and ditches. So just quickly looking at some of these photos, clockwise from the top obviously going to be looking at old and new fuel stores um risk maps down at the bottom we've got planet down there so we might want to look at um mvz or the nutrient field records and then also just uh, a quick uh, highlight of caroline's excellent um, article in the january british farmers and growers get that one in quick so that's worth a read as well um so moving on to the next slide now so this is um, when we're saying adios at the end. So we'll we'll recap on what we found. So we want to talk about the positives, not just any any potentially areas for improvement we might find. Um, obviously, where we do find a real issue that requires immediate action, then we'll tell you about this and we'll discuss what needs doing. But what we'll also do is we'll confirm that you'll receive a, a post visit cover letter, and also a compliance assessment form, which is also a farm inspection uh, report, different names, same thing. And that'll have some agreed actions in, some agreed timescales, which are movable, um, illustrative pictures just to help you understand the actions, and also a small section at the end about our enforcement response. 
And um, what you also might receive at, at the end of the visit is something called a PACE Code B notice, which is Police and Criminal Evidence Act Code B notice. Um, it's a legal requirement. Uh, if we do take photos, collect evidence, take some paperwork away with us to look at, um, we believe there might be some non-compliances, um, but it it's there to protect you as a recipient as it sets out our rights, uh, sorry, your rights, um, and our powers uh, when we're actually coming on site uh, to see you. So um, it's there to protect you um, and to give you confidence that we're doing the right thing. Um, it's not a ticket and it's not a fine. So it's not something to, to really be worried about. Okay, I just want to make that clear. And at the end, obviously, we'll reiterate that we want to help help you guys um, to improve your practices and businesses. So. Once we've done that, moving on to the next slide, you'll then re receive your post-visit letter. Again, it's a bit of a generic letter, but we, we are able to adapt it to the catchment and customer. So really, it'll just um, highlight that we've, thanks to letting us on your farm to come and see you. Um, and it explains that attached there's a, a report, which we'll move on to now in the next slide, please. So this is split into about five sections. So we'll go through each one in series. The top one that you'll first see is this general um, box, which has got all the details of yourselves, our details and contact details, um, the actual date we came, where we met you, what legislation we looked at, um, and also the date that we actually sent this report off to you. So that's fairly basic. The next part, section one, which is on the next slide. Um, so this is the actual uh, findings of the inspection. So this is the bit you're probably mostly interested in. So um, just in this, this example, um, hypothetical farm, there was only one thing that I needed to put a farm action in, and that was about um, the down pipes. Um, being broken and misconnected um, and what we really want is those to be correct so they don't cause, cause issues somewhere else on the farm such as picking up some um, muck or dirty water and washing that into the water course what we really want it to do is go straight down and recharge the groundwater as it as clean water so we then put some actions in once we've identified that as an issue um, tell you what needs to be done and in this case again maybe um, signpost you to your local catcher and sensitive farming advisor about potential grant aid that might be available to help with that. Then there'll be the agreed deadline. And again, I say, if you, if you do struggle with the deadlines, get in touch, they are movable in most cases. And then there'll be a, a photo reference, um, which you'll see in the next section. But also there's, a, there's an opportunity to, for us to add additional comments at the bottom. And in this case, it's, a, it's a, a nice thank you for, you know, being constructive. So we are looking to sort of build relationships with you guys. It's not a case of filling the form in, dumping it on you and walking away. We do want to have this process going forward. So if we move on to section two in the next slide, it's, as I say, um, Photographs to illustrate the farm actions, just so you're absolutely nailed on 100% sure what we're talking about. Helps avoid confusion, and there's also a description of what the picture's actually showing. So, in a nutshell, that's pretty much it on that section. Section three on the next slide, and also section four. This is the enforcement response and information notes. So, um, in terms of the enforcement response, um, there are some details um, at the top of this section, as in section four, so anything in grey is generally um, information for yourselves um, to read and help you understand a bit more about the, the form if you're not too sure before you give us a ring about it. Um, so we've got three options really on this form in terms of enforcement in inverted commas. So the first one, the top one is the one that most people use most of the time, which is the advice and guidance one. Um, there may be occasions though where there is something that we say, look, you know, we do need to issue a warning letter for this, in which case we'll take that box, send a warning letter out separately. And, and of course, we'll explain why that is. Um, we won't just do it willy nilly, of course. Um, and finally, there may be a box where we have to reconsider and think a bit longer about what enforcement options we have. Quite rare, in actual fact, those ones 
but at the end of the day, we're trying to help people. So wherever possible, we go with the first one. So after that, section four is the information notes and also there's a data protection section, which is very small print and uh, quite long. So I haven't put that one in for you. So um, if we can move on to the next slide, I just want to finish up um, just to say just some things to remember. Firstly, you know, when we're coming, we're trying to be civil and nice. We're all human beings, so let's be nice to each other. Um, we'll be civil to you. Please try and be civil back to us. I know it can be stressful. Completely understand that. I've been doing this for 27 years now. So, um, you know, I do understand how people feel when someone turns up. Um, but what I'd say is, is do, you know, try and be open and honest. And ultimately, your, your attitude will influence as well how the visit will go. Some other things um, to think about, these visits can actually really benefit you because um, if we do come and see you, uh, potentially you may at some point in the future get an RP inspection. And if you're in a BPS scheme and in MVZ, for example, our visit will actually help prepare the ground for those sort of visits. We we'll also highlight regulations and rules that you must comply with and give advice on how you can best do that. We'll therefore support you in becoming compliant. We'll also signpost you to helpful partners and grant schemes, such as Catchment Sensi Pharma and the water companies, if they've got grant schemes in your area. And also support you with planning applications as well. That's really a quite important thing. Uh, just one thing to remember, we are still regulators. Um, and on occasion, we may need to use those powers bestowed upon us. But this is usually after all other options are exhausted. OK. And finally, you know, if we do visit due to a pollution incident or complaints, then we'll take that approach applicable to the situation uh, we're dealing with. So separate to these sort of visits, but also what we'll probably do is usually we'll actually book a revisit in as a planned visit, such as we've just been discussing now. So um, final slide, please. So there's some contact details, myself and Caroline. Uh, what I'd like to say just at the bottom of that yellow box, if you have got a pollution problem or you think you might have or you see one, please just do think, phone the number. Uh, it's free 24-7. People like myself are on the end of the phone 24-7 to help you. Um, the sooner we act on incidents, the better. Um, it generally means we can reduce the impact. So finally, thanks for listening. And now we will move on uh, to Chris Hewis who is um, going to talk for you, and he's from Anglian Water. Over to you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Graham. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so, yeah, I'm Chris Hewis. I'm a catchment advisor with Anglian Water. I've been in the role just over a year now, um, following over 30 years' experience uh, managing beef and arable farms. So a lot of experience, both on, on your side, Defence, and now on, on our side. So... Why and how do Anglian Water work with farmers? Well, the why, um, we, we recognise that the water that we get coming to us through the rivers and through the water networks is, is coming from the catchment, coming from your farmland. Uh, and Anglian Water is essentially, all water companies are essentially engineering companies. We, we know pipes and valves and, you know, systems engineering. Um, and so we have a link between the water company and the farming network, and that's us as catchment advisors. So, so we work with, with farmers to ensure um, clean water heading our way before we get to the treatment plant. So on the next slide. Um, and this, this confirms why we do it. We're, we're, we're not regulators at all. We are regulated and we have to provide uh, wholesome water, drinking water, with um, pesticides no greater than 0.1 part per billion in, in the water. So these are some of the common pesticides we see coming through. You'll notice metaldehyde on there. That's gone now, but it was the hardest of any to, to be removed. Couldn't be re removed in most cases. So this was when, when the water company realized that we needed to work with farmers to try and mitigate some of this before it got into our um, reservoirs and, and treatment plants. So if, if levels are too high of these pesticides, if we go um, far too high, we, we have to stop abstraction and then that's water for gone. We're losing that water. 
it's going down the rivers, it's going out to sea, we have to switch off our abstraction, we can't fill the reservoirs. And as we know, it's it's not just water quality we're thinking about, it's it's sustainability and quantity. Now, water resources, we, we don't want to be letting water go if we need to fill reservoirs. So this, this is why we work with farmers um, to try and keep these levels down. We have various um, treatment methods and mitigations. So if, if levels are over 0.1, we don't switch off at 0.1, we can blend, we can do treatment processes, um, but it's when it goes too high that we have to let it go. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. So Anglian Water has, um, has this commitment called Get River Positive. Um, you'll hear the same from Seven Trent. Um, and the third of those pledges, support others to improve and care for rivers, is, is forms the basis of, of most of our work with farmers. It's the overarching framework for, for our grant schemes and um, sort of defining how we work with others. Uh, the, other, the other four pledges on there have been worked on um, all the time right now by other parts of the business. But that third pledge is the one that, um, that drives us to work with farmers. Okay. So our main um, funding scheme to work with farmers through the year is the Farm Innovation Grant. Um, you'll be familiar with this type of thing. It's similar to other grant schemes, um, but it varies in that we don't have a set prescribed list of options. We don't have a menu for you to choose from. Um, we know that farmers know their farms best. They know their businesses best. They know how they can um, best improve them. So. We say you come to us with your ideas of innovation that's going to affect water quality and we'll look at it. So we have this open for six weeks uh, in the autumn um, last year and uh, we had all the bids come in. It was an online end trade platform and then we assess all the bids. The whole team get together and assess the bids. We score them and they're all ranked um, on various criteria. And then the successful ones, we, we've done funding. So it's up to seven and a half thousand. And we look to sort of match fund with those. We don't look to 100% fund any project. But we had a um, whole list of, of projects came in that were successful. And you can see a list down on the bottom there. Water Bowser, which is a farmer wanting to change his whole practice into um, using cover crops and grazing them. And he's, he's not got water supply where he wants to graze on his normally arable farm. So that was one. Um, and of course, that uh, living mulch. So farmers wanting to try that with understories of clover, micro clover. So reducing their inputs of, of uh, manufactured N. Um, yeah, and various other ones, some, some yard work, um, direct drills, a number of cover crop um, drill units to, to mount onto cultivators and some um, fertilizer placement technology as well to be added to machinery. So this grant um, is targeted at some of our more priority catchments where we have more issues in the water. It is available, you're not, not um, excluded from applying wherever you are in Anglian water area, but when we come to the scoring and ranking, uh, there'll be a higher score for ones in uh, priority catchments. Um, However, if, if you've got a really good project, farmers have come to us with really good projects that are going to have a good impact on water quality. Maybe they're, they're um, good at promoting, you know, they're in a, a good area, they've got a, a lot of networks. Um, so we'll look at that one too. And that might be some learnings that we can spread into our priority catchments. So um, yeah, we look at what the priorities are in each catchment and, and target it there. Hopefully this will, um, go again this year and the plan is to run it earlier this year, run it earlier in the year so um, you're able to, farmers can get funding for projects that they want to do later in the year. Um, okay, thank you, we'll move on. Another grant scheme we ran this year, very successful, um, a straightforward, pretty simple um, cover crop offer. So we we worked with Oak Bank Seeds, um, who have a lot of knowledge about cover crops and, and the capabilities of cover crops with soil health. And we have realized the benefit of cover crops for us. So holding soil on the fields, soil stability, holding nitrogen um, in the fields. Um, and so we realized that if we could get a big area of cover crops in our catchments, that, that would be beneficial to us. So we partnered with Oak Bank and we offered 
a, a straightforward um, £25 a hectare for a minimum of 10 hectares of seed. Um, and then farmers, the majority of farmers that applied, they've, they've sort of scaled their, their bids up, um, their offers up, and they've either grown a bigger area or they've grown complex mixes. But um, still that £250 was there to be taken off the bill at the end of the day. Um, we had uh, a very straightforward application process. We were contacted by growers. We gave them a code, they rang Oak Bank, um, and it all worked very well. So we had uh, a total of 1,900 hectares of seed were ordered on the back of that um, process. So again, this is something we're looking to roll out again this year. And what we're hoping is the, the, the plans are being drawn now. Farmers who took, um, took up the offer in 2022 will be um, contacted with with a sort of um, a follow-up from Oak Bank um, and then we can go again this year again slightly earlier last year we had issues with the the dry conditions in the summer it wasn't favorable for drilling cover crops um, so we'll be going this year earlier on in the year and uh, getting those seed orders in at the right time sort of June July uh, thank you move on Another way we worked with growers this year, it was um, a new scheme we, we devised for a farmer training grant. And we realize, as I said before, it's, it's the farmers that know the farms best, uh, know how to farm them. And we've uh, done the training grant. So if somebody wanted to do facts or basis or, or any, any course that was going to develop their knowledge of land management, soil management, benefits of soil health, um, and we've we've done some 50% funding of those up to 500 pounds, and um, that was very popular. And um, yeah, and uh, something that I think it was so successful, we'll be looking to run that again. Um, so there should be good, some some good outcomes there. And th these are uh, sort of mutually beneficial things for us as a water company. If the growers are are um, more using more responsible methods on the farm and and following all this training. And then we get um, the benefits of better land use, better land management too. Okay. Move on, please. Landscape Enterprise Networks. Uh, this doesn't happen all over the country, but it's something we're involved in, certainly through Northamptonshire um, and over to some areas in Suffolk. So the lens scheme is it's uh, a little bit like a big version of our farm innovation grant. And what this is, is a collaboration um, where um, businesses put money into um, a funding stream. So companies like Nestle and Cargill um, wanting to support regenerative agricultural practices. So um, along with ourselves and other water companies, we put money in and then in a similar way to our grant scheme, it, it, all the bids are assessed um and delivered out to to the successful growers so again it's um similar similar projects come out of this uh, as came out of our grant lots of cover crops direct drilling um legume plant, planting legumes and um yeah moving to to reduce tillage is, is quite a popular one so again these are uh are, you know, beneficial to both the farmers and uh, the water companies. So it's something we're happy to get involved in. And the benefits for the companies on this is it's it's collaboration and it's multiplying the, the money in. So for a small amount we put in, other companies put money in and uh, multiply the benefits out on in the uh, in the countryside. So that's Landscape Enterprise Networks. Um, I know that's open right now. It's, it's not something we deliver ourselves. It's through... Um, suppliers so people like charles jackson um and you can find out about that online and that's something that's running right now too thank you move on uh and so the the one that is running all year round is our face-to-face -face contact and we have a team of advisors six of us there covering the whole um anglian water network and we are out on farm we're getting in front of farmers, talking to farmers um, at things like Enroso training days, um, CSF events, uh, other NFU events, and sort of the uh, uh, agronomy supply companies. 
So we're always willing to talk to farmers and see what they're interested in, what they want to do. Um, and obviously it depends on the priority of whether they're upstream or downstream of our abstraction points, but we're always willing to talk to farmers and, and see what it is that um, their ideas they have for improving drinking water quality. Um, but as I say, we're not we're not regulators. We come on farm to work with you. We see farmers as, as part of the solution, not the problem uh, with drinking water quality. So it's why we like to work uh, collaboratively with farmers. Um, and we always look for mutually beneficial projects. So whether it's cover crops holding things in the field longer that, that the, the inputs that you've bought or um, that, that's you know, beneficial to the farmer and to the water company. So we always look for mutual benefit. Um, I think that is my slide, last slide, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I'd like to hand over now to Adam from Seven Trent. Sorry, I'm getting my video going. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, yes, um, I'm Adam Freer. I'm a catchment management scientist from Seven Trent. Um, so, yeah, broadly um, fulfilling the same capacity as, as Chris at Anglian. Uh, so, yeah, just going to spend a few minutes uh, taking you through what we have on offer um, from Seven Trent and why we're we doing it. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, just a, a, a brief overview of, of the bits we're going to cover. Um, yeah, why are we doing catch-up management at Seven Trent? Um, where is the support available? Um, as there are some targeted areas, um, as there always is. Um, we've also got a, a closed transfer system offer that's just opening. Um, we've got our step scheme, some different item packages uh, for various bits and pieces. Um, a bit on our test, protect and improve scheme uh, which is just starting and then just to touch on a few of the little bits that we we do have available uh, next slide please yeah so um very much echoing what what chris was saying before um you know, why why are water company um doing catch and management why are we interested well um many of our surface and groundwater abstractions are impacted by various water quality risks um, and that can come from from industry um, but also from the surrounding farmland um, the seven trent region you know we cover all the way up into the hills of derbyshire down to fruit growing country um, around herefordshire gloucestershire um, but then in the east mids you know an awful lot of arable area um, the three risks that we generally face um, across our abstractions are our pesticides, which is generally from um, from crops, but also a little bit from grassland. Um, nitrates um, cause quite a few issues for us, particularly our groundwater borehole abstractions. Um, so they would be more looking at fertilizer usage, slurry, and more and more digestate. Um, and then cryptosporidium, um, which a few people might not have heard of, but they're a tiny parasitic um, animals, um, bacteria, which are present in they can be present in any form of, of animal waste um, or human waste. So animal waste and slurry are the, are the general uh, culprits there. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the main reason we want to work with, with you guys um, rather than just pouring more concrete are the, the many reasons. Um, obviously there's a, there's a mutual benefit for your, both your business and, and for ours in, in most cases. Um, it's a sustainable option. We can only build <laughs> build so many treatment works, pour so much concrete. Um, tackling the root of the problem is 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 the best way. Um, there are wider environmental benefits. So, for roughly every one pound is spent on catch and management, you get about four back in wider environmental benefit. That might be um, places for people to to walk. You know, nice wildflower meadows and things like that. Um, and then lastly, some risks are very, very hard to remove. Um, as Chris said, there is a, a bit of a sliding scale with, with pesticides, with metaldehyde formerly being at the very, very top. Um, there are others which are still very persistent um, and hard to get rid of. Um, and some have a habit of hanging around, particularly in groundwater for many, many years. 
Um, also things like cryptosporidium are very resistant to disinfection from chlorination. So once they get into a treatment works, it can be quite a, an issue to, to solve that. Um, and it usually means that the works has to be shut down or the borehole has to be shut down. Um, as I mentioned, quite a few of our, um, quite a bit of our area was in sort of the hills of Derbyshire or are into Staffordshire. Um, and so where we have these small, small isolated communities, they might, you know, shutting down the borehole there might actually have quite a significant impact to get water to them. And sometimes we have to tanker, uh, tanker alternative supplies in. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so we, this is a bit of a subset of our wider area, uh, focusing on the East Mids, but we, we have 44 priority catchments where the risks that I just mentioned are maybe a bit more acute um, than, than others. Um, so you appreciate it is not the best map. There is a link there um, for after if, if you want to go and have a look on our website. But there's broadly surface water catchments, which are the big, the big colored blobs. Um, and then the groundwater catchments are the, the rounder, smaller blobs. Um, uh, in general, the surface catchments, um, so the, the big one in the middle there is the Derwin and then there's the Dove. Um, down towards where it says Leicester, there's around Stone Harold. Um, they're mainly pesticide priority catchments. Um, so we're looking to specifically target that, that risk in those catchments. Um, elsewhere, uh, you'll see over by uh, Mansfield, there's an awful lot of uh, groundwater catchments for nitrate. Uh, so we may be more interested in things like cover crops. Um, in those areas, but but it, it it does vary, and the best uh, the best way of uh, finding out more is to talk to our agricultural advisors. We've got a, a very friendly uh, expert uh, expert team. Um, there's now about thirty of them who cover various catchments. Um, I'm sure some of you have already bumped into them, um, and they're all experts in the field. Many of them are from uh, farms themselves, so they've. We've got a real investment in making things better for everybody. Um, across our region, we have various uh, grant schemes on offer. Um, again, our advisors do offer one-to-one -one advice and support. Um, we do occasionally run webinars um, as well. There is actually one which has just finished this morning. Um, and yeah, other support schemes are available. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we've got a, a closed transfer system offer. If anybody was at Lama um, the other week, you'll have seen a few of these kicking about. Um, they are very new, um, but for our seven trend pesticide priority catchments uh, for the month of February only, uh, we are offering to pay 100% of cost of a closed transfer system. Um, so being able to fill your sprayer um, with basically no risk of the spillage of the of the active onto the ground um it's all <clears throat> it's all in this closed transfer unit there's two or three in the country at the minute um uh, yeah uh, uh, various suitabilities for different sizes of, of containers some will only do 20 liters and above some will do 20 liters and below um but yeah for february only we're offering to 100 percent of the cost um there's two of those products are on offer. Um, I can't give the names right now, but um, could uh, could uh, another point. Um, and it also includes the cost of installation if there's any adaptation for plumbing needed to be done to the machine. Um, after February, we'll be offering closed transfer systems in our step scheme, uh, with that be at the usual 50% funding rate. And again, including uh, the cost of installation, if that's what you needed. Um, those who are eligible are sprayer operators um, within our pesticide catchments. Um, that does include contractors. You just need to provide um, maps of the, of the land that you are spraying um, and or SBI numbers if, if you have them available. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so we've got our seven trend environmental protection scheme or steps, which has been running for about 
I think this is its eighth year we've been going. Um, it's had various alterations over that period, but um, essentially it's a, it, it takes a lot of uh, the different options from uh, countryside stewardship, um, but not as extensive. There's about 50 on there, ranging from things like cover crops um, to fencing and pesticide washdown areas. The current way we're operating is it's a 12 month rolling scheme. Um, so we have a scheme that actually finishes, it's currently up and now finishes next Tuesday. So we've got a week left. And then after that, the next cycle will start, we're hoping in March. Um, you, it's a simple uh, online application through a, uh, an online portal, which you can be helped through by one of the advisors. Um, we have around a four to six week turnaround time for agreements. Um, to notify you if, if you've been successful. Um, there's a bit of evidence required, so like before photos or uh, quotes for various items. Um, and then you've got 12 months to do the work. Um, <clears throat> most stuff is offered at around a 50% rate, but some are more, um, and that goes up to about £10,000 per farm holding per year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so within steps there are these priority offers that we that we put together, um, which are a few of the different items together, um, just to make them a bit more appealing, really. Um, so for pesticide washdown areas, again focusing more on big arable farms, um, the fifty percent funding will go up to twenty thousand uh, pounds, plus an additional five thousand for if you wanted to add rainwater harvesting onto the shed. Um, if you were to able to complete that work within six months, which a few of our farms have done, we will pay an extra 25%, um, up to a maximum of, of 30,000. So the total cost of the of the works would be um, <clears throat> 40 in that case. Um, and that applies for the pesticide washdown area, the roofing for it, um, and then either a lined biobed or biofilter, you would need one of either of those. Um, and of course, there are some, a couple of um, EA exemptions um, that you would need with those. Um, if you're applying for that, you just need to supply us with um, before photos, plans of what you're gonna do, um, and then quotes. Um, we do also offer the sofa visit, which I'll touch on in a second, which can be available to help plan the project. Um, next slide. We do have a priority cover crop offer. Um, so the rate has gone up this year in line with stewardship. I believe, um, but we're also offering for farmers in our uh, groundwater priority catchments, there is free soil testing and soil health um, planning webinars, which will be delivered. Um, the soil testing is a, is above and beyond what you'd be required to do as a, a regulatory requirement under farming rules for water. Um, there are various, you know, various cover crops available. It's either the winter cover crops, um, although quite a few of farmers are now under sowing maize. Um, there are a few who are also doing the more sort of flowery uh, summer catch crops as well. Um, so yeah, uh, quite a few different varieties are are considered, and it, it's up to you specifically what variety you use, as long as you let us know. Um, you can apply now um, sort of speculatively and then if you once you've got the rotation sorted you know exactly where stuff is going you can confirm that later in the in the year around August um, ready for them being put in and should be established around 15th September. Uh, next slide please. Uh, yes we've got uh, another another set of, of support available. So we have we have been running a stream called Swappy Nozzles, which was all about reduced uh, drift nozzle technology. Um, and there was also an accompanying webinar to it. That was mainly aimed at farmers within our catchments, but there is actually one on the 24th of February for those who don't fall inside a priority catchment and basis and the Rosa points are available for that. Um, we have our specialist on farm advice visits. Um, which do include things such as soil testing, farm infrastructure, pesticide washing areas, um, and water management. There are others, and the best thing is to talk to your uh, is the is to talk to the advisor, uh, your local advisor. 
Um, there will also be a biodiversity scheme that is coming out and we're thinking it's probably going to be April. Uh, more biodiversity driven options, I should say, um, but we haven't got full details of that yet. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the final bit I'll cover um, just to touch on is uh, there's a test, protect and improve scheme which we're offering. It is a little bit uh, outside these mids, um, but it's looking more at cryptosporidium in livestock uh, as part of our bathing rivers catchments, which are something which came, <coughs> came through um, after COVID, um, is that for people to go swimming in rivers basically. Um, to try and reduce crypto and bacteria from, uh, from animal wastes. Um, and that's based around uh, a livestock specific webinar, um, free testing kits for cryptosporidium for attendees. And then following that, um, possibly animal health risk assessments if there was like, if there was uh, positive tests coming off the back of that. If you could just flick up the next slide, please, there is a map on there. Um, yeah, yeah, apologies, it's not too brilliant, but um, if just at the top um, might be coming into our patch um, around Lutterworth. Um, so yeah, if there's anybody interested in that, uh, get in touch if you do fall into that area. I believe that might be my last slide. Yes, so there's a couple of links there for just our list of advisors um, and what areas they cover. And then the one at the bottom um, is a, a map where you can punch in your postcode and see if you fall in the catchment. Thank you. Um, and I'll now hand over to uh, Bob Marsden at CSF. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, hello, my name is Bob Marsden. I'm the Rural Basin District Coordinator for Catchment Sensitive Farming for the East Midlands. Um, next slide, please. And today I'm going to give a quick run through about who, what, where and when and how we operate in CSF. Next slide, please. Uh, so as I've just described, I am the uh, River Basin District Coordinator. I am a part of um, 16 catchment sensitive farm advisors in the East Midlands. I have two senior officers as well and some admin staff as well, as well as the advisors out on the ground. Each catchment has an advisor. Next slide, please. Uh, well, what is CSF? Uh, we are led by Natural England Environment Agency. We're a partnership project directly funded by DEFRA with ring-fenced funding for Natural England, and we deliver it in partnership with the Environment Agency. And uh, there is talk of the Forestry Commission coming on board as well. That's quite um, exciting. Uh, and we work together with farmers and organisations across all areas of England now to improve the quality of water and air and to reduce flood risks as well. Next slide, please. How do we do this? Uh, well, we have lots and lots of events. Uh, so this is one we had a few uh, years ago, demonstrating innovative new forms of slurry application methods, looking at training shoes, dribble bars, and injectors. Uh, this one we called Minimuk, and over 100 farmers attended. Next slide, please. Uh, we also do lots of um, land testing as well. Uh, this is quite a common um, pattern we find when we're doing the soil testing. This is just looking at phosphate levels. You can see in white the um, farmstead there with a the slurry store and obviously the farmer knows he can get four to five loads an hour out of his slurry store in those fields close to his slurry store and as he gets further away he puts less slurry on and those fields become deficient um, in phosphate. The purple ones which are a very high level of phosphate is actually getting to a point where it's at risk of being lost through leaching even though it's a cation. The green ones are at the optimum, and then if we see a few fields that are much further away, they are suboptimum at uh, indexes zero and one, uh, and uh, they will actually be having a crop penalty for low phosphate levels in those soils. Uh, so we try and help farmers redistribute their slurry and manure applications to try and even help. The aim is that we would like to see all those fields green to have optimum levels of phosphate for crop production and lowest risk of loss through runoff and leaching. Next slide, please. And again, lots of training. Uh, these were all farms we put through their PA one, two, and six. Uh, they all turned up, they all qualified and passed. Next slide, please. And again, this is a midsummer evening river walk that we had um, uh, a few years ago on the River Dove with Dave Ottawa there uh, from the Environment Agents looking at the biology of the river, so how we assess the quality of that river. Next slide, please. 
And again, this is uh, photos of a different event, but we actually reran this event last Wednesday where we had um, 60 farmers turn up looking at all the different types of um, slurry storage available to farmers in the area where we looked at uh, tin towers that are now 32 years old and still looking like new, uh, lined lagoons and various other understore uh, slurry storage solutions as well. Next slide, please. Um, and here we uh, have farm walks that are coming up. Uh, we've got a series of farm walks entitled, Are Your Cultivations Costing the Earth? And these are on the um, 6th, uh, the 8th and 13th of February uh, around uh, Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire. Next slide, please. And that's uh, my old mate Des in a hole where I tried to keep him, uh, looking at soil structure and rooting there. Next slide, please. And again, this is a, a large series of walks, partly funded by the um, Seven Trent Water as well. Uh, I'm looking at our white peat trials. We are extremely keen on promoting the use of these legume and herb rich swords. Uh, they are highly productive, uh, which we're all for. Uh, low import in terms of bag nitrogen, in fact, zero. You can still apply slurries and manure on them. They have a very large, wide, flexible grazing window, as since there's so many species and there's always something. Um, at the right stage in lush and ready for the cows to eat. Highly palatable, so they increase voluntary intakes as well. And recent research is showing that they also reduce greenhouse methane gas emissions from grazing livestock as well, something to do with the protein. And they also aid uh, rainwater infiltration because they um, create such great soil structure with their varied rooting depths. So actually our flood risk management um, mitigation as well. So we'll, last year we had a farm walk every month between April and October. This year, we think we might actually run two a month. Uh, they're very well attended. Next slide, please. And we also have our drop-in center at Bakewell Market every Monday as well, where you can come and speak to us and uh, find out whatever you need to know. Next slide, please. And just now we're gonna talk briefly about environmental stewardship and the options that we have in countryside stewardship, which is gonna be called Countryside Stewardship Plus. Uh, we've got something in there for all farmers, and we have some great options here. So we've got the AB6, the Enhanced Overwinter Stubble, available to all farmers at now £522 per hectare. Uh, we've also got the AB15, the two-year legume fallow, very popular as well, particularly if you've got a field with black grass problems in it. If you put in the two-year legume fallow, uh, there's very little black grass seed left by the third year. That is £593 per hectare. This will also increase your soil organic matter levels as well and aid cultivation and crop establishment. And then, as we've just talked about, we've got the GS4 legume and herb rich swords, which has gone up to £382 per hectare. And again, the whole crop cereals. Uh, and we'll be frank about this. We are clearly trying to buy you out of maize production because, as we said earlier, it makes creates all sorts of issues for us and the environment. So the whole crop cereals uh, is to replace maize. It's spring sown, has an overwintered stubble after it, which is great for biodiversity as well. Um, and that has gone up now to 584 pounds per hectare. Next slide, please. And as you can see from this slide, this is just, uh, and we've got farmers doing this on a whole farm case. This is an intensive dairy farm. I've called it Holstein Holding, 100 hectares, 120 dairy cows plus farmers. Um, He's got 20% of his land in um, whole crop cereals, which can be wheat and peas or barley, beans and oats. So requiring no uh, bad nitrogen fertilizer, 80% of his land in legume and herb rich swords, again, requiring no bagged nitrogen fertilizer. But those percentages and at those payment rates, his average payment is 422 pounds a hectare, which gets him 42,400 uh, pounds a year in countryside stewardship payments. He's saving on nitrogen and fertilizers an additional 26,300 a year. So between those options and he's saving on fertilizer and he's still growing a huge amount of forage for his 100 cows and followers, he is 68,700 pounds a year better off. Um, if you want to see a farmer who's doing this, you need to attend our legume and herb rich swords trials every month starting in April to see when these farms in action. Next slide, please. Uh, where and when I'm talking about now, the green and yellow areas uh, are merged together in one complete area. However, from the 1st of April this year, we're also operating advice, giving advice only in the white areas of well as well. 
Um, slightly different maps, uh, you can see on there, for various reasons, we have all the tame and anchor, along with the meese catchment, which uh, we look after in the East Midlands region. Next slide, please. Uh, and if you've got any questions, obviously you can come and see us at Bakewell Market every Monday. I'm there with some of my catchment advisors, but you can also just request a callback from your local advisor at that email address there. Um, that is everything I've got to say. I'd now like to hand over to Caroline Hook from the Environment Agency's Anglian area. Or go straight to Q&A. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. I think we'll go straight to Q&A. Caroline's a bit shocked then. Um, great. That's really good. Could everybody uh, switch on their, all the panelists switch on their question, uh, their video, sorry. Um, we've, had, we've had obviously quite, quite a lot of information imparted in the last, um, last hour. Um, we've now got uh, 20 minutes to close, uh, before we close the meeting. Um, I've got a couple of questions in the box. Um, if there are anybody else out there with questions to ask, then please pose them as soon as possible. Um, just Bob, just finishing off on on your piece that this in South we, East East Midlands covers South Lincolnshire as well. That 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 area is obviously operated by CSF Natural England East Anglia region. Is that right? That is correct. Although yeah. you did send me down to do a farm visit there last Friday, Simon, which oh, I well really appreciated. <laughs> Um, so you guess it's nice to get you out your area. Um, so, okay, um, that's uh, so that there are if there are there were white gaps there with with uh, Bob's map that they are covered by other other natural England um, catchment sensitive farming. Um, so just uh, turning to some of the questions here, um, I'll come back to you, Caroline, in a minute with um, with uh, something I've, I'm sort of um, looking at. Um, but there's two in from Peter Gad. Well done, Peter. Um, uh, Mentioned that Adam, you talked about the um, contained transfer systems. Uh, how do you accurately measure how parts can with a CPS? Um, I think the different systems have different ways of dealing with it, um, but most incorporate some kind of measuring vessel within them. Um, yeah. Either either like a marks on a jug or 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 a digital meter. Um, yeah, there's, uh, the, I remember the, the Pentair system definitely has like gradations on it, and I think all the manufacturers report them more accurate than by eye. And you can you can work it back from there. Um, mm. the, the, how are you proposing to promote the um, CTS system? It comes up in February because I think uh, most of us would probably be quite keen to spread the news on. Yeah, all if, so if, if you if you're in a Seven Trent area, of course. Yeah, so I think we we do have a list. Um, of people who obviously worked with us before so we'll be going to them but um i think it will be available on our website um there is a seven trend catch and management um it should be on there um failing that if you if you if you are in an area and you haven't um and you want a bit more information uh, get in touch with your local advisor is the best way with all of our um, stuff and the, those those guys and their names and numbers and emails are listed on the uh, on the seven trend website um, yeah. Which which leads me on to the second question from Peter Gadd. Is there a one-stop shop online listing the ST7 Trent offers? Uh, uh, most of, yes. Yeah. <laughs> most of them are now are on our the seven uh, the catch from management part of the website. Um, it does get updated fairly regularly. Um, the the post transfer system thing is very much hot yeah. off the press. Um, and can you um, can you can you subscribe to an instant sort of update email update from Seven Trent whenever they put anything up new on that? Just to stop. Uh, it's it not that week. it's not that fancy, unfortunately. Not that fancy. Um, no, um, I, will, I will make a note of that. That would be a good thing to. It, it, to would, be, it would be. Uh, it would just help. It just help bring things to people's minds when they or attention when it's when it's up there and new. Okay. Um, uh, we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Um, we are certified organic. Which of these schemes will be useful for us? Um, uh, uh, Graham, I know that's not your scheme, um, but Bob and, the, and Adam and Chris, um, uh, certified organic, how do you patch into those people? Um, well, I'll, I'll start off with this. Um, there are different payment rates uh, for the certified organic people in countryside stewardship because a lot of the stuff that is currently in the GS4 herbal maize is already paid for 
in organic. So there is a, another option for organic farmers with a slightly reduced payment rate because some of the options that we're paying for in that scheme are already being paid for under the organic scheme. Uh, I can only speak about countryside stewardship in our best uh, practice. I don't know how that links in with the uh, water company schemes though. You get extra points from a water company if you're not putting so much chemical on. From our side, it would be there would be no exclusion from any of our schemes. We wouldn't be paying for organic measures, but for all of our grant schemes, be that cover crops or the innovation grant, okay. absolutely all farms included, whatever type. Okay, and uh, that'll be the same for seven trend Adam. Or? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, Trevor Foss, uh, slightly off piece question, um, but when looking at abstraction and renewal or not, is the impact on food production taken into consideration? I guess this is about um, renewal of abstraction licenses and renewing them, which for mm -hmm. many farmers will be coming up fairly shortly. Um, it's more of an environmental agency question, that one's excellent, Graham. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the straight answer is no, not at the moment. Um, there is a review going on of um, abstractions and how we're going to move forward in the future with abstractions and charging. So um, currently, um, I'm speaking off the top of my head now, um, we're looking to change how the uh, abstraction licenses uh, are actually implemented. So going forward, I believe that they're going to come under the environmental permitting regulations, yeah. which will mean there'll be changes to uh, for, firstly, how how you're charged, there'll be new bandings, um, but also secondly, how your permit looks. Um, I suppose the positive side is that if you do have environmental permits from the Environment Agency going forward, they'll all look pretty much the same um, and they won't be confusing in terms of um, some have got nomenclature in it from 30 years ago and uh, et cetera. So they'll all be coming under the same regs eventually. But yeah, at the moment, it is a good point. Um, but no, I don't think that's in the consideration in terms of the sort of practicalities at the moment. But um, it is something that maybe does need to be thought about in the future. Obviously, if you're in a catchment that um, is already tight on water resources, mm. um, where there are restrictions, um, then that could mean that if you wanted to up the amount of water you had to produce more food, currently you might not be able to do that. But it's a, it's a good it's a good question pointing out that maybe for future food production, do those um, restrictions need? Yeah. Um, it's um, it's certainly something that's high on the agenda. There's uh, recently we've seen the publication of water resource reports for what's our water resources east. That's the east of England, basically it includes Lincolnshire and uh, parts of Nottinghamshire and Northamptonshire. Uh, the rest of the region is covered by water resources west. Both have uh, draft water resource plans out in place at the moment, out for consultation effectively. Um, both um, provide a lot of insight into the conundrum we do have, and that is that most catchments and most water resources are up to capacity, and that at everybody, everybody, agriculture included, but that's energy and water companies as well, are going to have to move aside to make sure that more enough water is left in the environment. And a classic example of that is. You know, degrading chalk streams, for example, with, with taking too much water out. Uh, and it's making space for environment, which is, which is the issue, because that obviously adds to capacity. So um, our guess is that any any of the agencies, statutory or otherwise, will be looking to see who um, who is uh, or where cutbacks can be made. And that's the biggest, biggest problem. Uh, if you look at a place like Nottinghamshire with its sand land, if you haven't got water on the sand, you aren't producing anything. Um, and how much those guys will be cut back, for example, is pretty crucial to their future businesses. So uh, there is there is a there is this big question coming up as to how we do that. And uh, and uh, a main problem with agriculture at the current time, from my knowledge, is that we're we're struggling with, if you like, data that tells us what are our forecasts going forward. And unlike water companies who are very good at doing that, uh, agriculture is not so good at doing that because nobody's actually ever looked at it before. So. Um, yeah, there, there are some key strategic policy areas around that which are, are going to pose some consultations. I'm, I'm happy to take them in any few perspective. We're trying to make sure we keep on top of that one so that there is water for the future in, in terms of farming businesses. And okay. I, think, I think a good point also, Simon, is that, that there's, there's undoubtedly going to be 
um, opportunities to be more efficient at using the water as well. So if we can, like other areas of uh, energy and water, other resources, you know, if we can get more efficient, there will be more available. So yeah, using it wisely. Is yeah, no, and, 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 all, and all that, there, there's going to be a number of different tools in the toolbox to actually achieve that. Um, Caroline, just to give you an air today, um, um, your, um, it was mentioned, I don't know whether that can be seen by everybody, but there's an article in the January British Farmer and Grower, um, which features a case study from linkage of farmer Emma, Emma Billings, who uh, had her first in farm inspection with Caroline Hook. Um, Caroline, you're, you're on the call today. Well done. Um, how do you, uh, how did that go? What was what was Emma Billings' reaction to the inspection? She, she was quite positive about it in the article. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, she was very positive about it. It was a, a good inspection. Um, she was quite shocked to have the inspection, um, but being part of the the Red Tractor scheme, um, she did have a lot of the paperwork in place already. Um, so if, if you are up to date with things like that and you are in schemes, a lot of it is just looking at what you already have, uh, assessing what you might not have um, and looking at any improvements as well, any pollution prevention. Um, yeah. But yeah, she was she was really engaging. Um, like I say, a little bit shocked to see us. But once we'd had a bit of a chat uh, and she realised that I was there to help um, and, and look at improvements. Um, yeah, it was a really good inspection. Um, yeah. And from that, we, we've built built a, a good rapport where she's then um, advising other farmers in the area not to not to worry as well which is great news good she's uh, I know she's uh, she does a regular slot on the radio Lincolnshire and, and BBC Lincolnshire farming programs um, it, it's 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 one of the things which obviously we see quite a lot of in the NFU and that is um, um, uh, stressful uh, the stress of inspections uh, which which Graham mentioned and and how nervous people do get um, you know, it's like sort of saying the visit from the gamekeeper. Um, it, it's um, I, I are things like the deadlines um, with money being tight. There will be questions about how you finance. So, so both Graham and Caroline are, are deadlines negotiable. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that, um, Simon. Yes, they are negotiable, um, and it would be taken into account how large the job is uh, and make realistic time scales. Um, and they would be agreed at the time of the visit um, through conversation, taking money into account uh, and personal circumstances as well. But if for some reason deadlines are not achievable for whatever reason, I would just urge people to contact us. If they contact us and they chat with us, we can extend them. It's only if we see that an effort isn't being made and we don't have any contact from people that that becomes a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So, so the watchword is don't bury the paperwork on the mantelpiece, but to actually do something about it, even if you've got a problem, contact and start talking. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very good advice. Um, thank you for that. Um, we have a uh, pointer to uh, the question here about uh, is, is anybody giving any grants towards the construction of silage clamps? Uh, and I'll carry that in with construction of manure storage and dirty water as well. Um, Bob, you'll probably be okay with uh, what is now known as SIG, so Slurry Investment Grants, which um, from an East Midlands perspective are available in some areas, but not everywhere. Uh, well, several things. Uh, it's the Slurry Infrastructure Grant, SIG. Um, everyone is available to apply and the DEFRA would like as many people to apply as possible because that creates a better and stronger business case for having more money in subsequent years. They are talking, we had a meeting with them last Wednesday of going on for another four or five years after this. Yeah. Um, so that scheme is open for slurry storage through their scheme. Under countryside stewardship, with the help of your CSF advisor, we can cover slurry stores uh, with a roof. Uh, and with the way these quotes are coming in and the standard uh, grant rate that is available, we're looking at it actually might be cheaper to get a grant aid on a cover for a slurry store from CSF and panel it out at your own cost might actually be cheaper than one of these very expensive slurry stores that we're seeing quotes for with grant rates on it. We're actually working through the numbers on that as we speak. Good. It's, it's a question about silage pits. Again, in a very particular set of circumstances, i.e. 
the existing silage clamp drains into a slurry store and we can create more slurry storage by covering that clamp to keep the rainwater out of the slurry store. We can grant aid covers for silage pits, but not the creation of a whole new silage pit with walls as well. Um, but we can, in certain circumstances as well, grant aid a cover for a uh, manure storage shed. Uh, again, that's only the roof, not the sides. Um, and that will all have to be contained and comply with the SAFO regulations. So you will have to invite Graham or Caroline onto your farm uh, at your own free will to get a letter from them to claim your grant money. Okay, so that that's uh, that. I mean, that's there is obviously with with uh, everything going under the agricultural transition plan, the, 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 there is this opening up. Do we? Um, I mean, there are quite a big areas of East Midlands which aren't currently covered by the the current round of slurry um, infrastructure grants. But um, uh, is is that a possibility in round two and round three as we go forward? It's uh, um, my understanding, having been trained by DEFRA next week, is. Everyone's eligible to apply. It is targeted in those target areas. Mm -hmm. Some of the target areas through the rest of the country are not in areas where they produce slurry. So That's we true. actually, That's in these spirits, <laughs> might be in a better position than what you think. Um, uh, but again, okay. everyone's eligible to apply. They've got a, not a bad budget this year, but they are looking at growing that mm -hmm. budget. So everyone is encouraged who produces mm -hmm. slurry to apply. I think uh, I think Bob, the watchword probably is if you if you've got an interest in actually looking at the grant and, and and making a claim on it, then even if you aren't in an eligible area, do by all means contact um, Defra and the RPA with with a potential for an application because it does flag up to um, the the, uh, the decision makers on this policy um, that there is actually interest in an area, so um, it, it would maybe help uh, people's case going forward. So. Uh, that'd be a good tip there, I think. Right, okay. so, can I just quickly jump in and say, yeah, uh, looking at looking at some of the the Q and A, is that if someone's thinking of building a new muck store, slurry store, silage clamp, or reconstructing one to make it bigger, then you do need to contact the agency in good time. I would suggest before you start actually buying any products, so we can endorse what you're doing or give some advice and guidance to make sure that you don't waste some money. Um, and do yeah, it for this yeah. right the first time. No, no, take take some. It's, 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 that's good advice. Um, uh, Chris, uh, there's a question in the uh, in the Q and A. Is Angling Water considering a similar um, SF uh, steps? Uh, sorry, Seven Trent steps program to assist farmers in their region. I think what I detect is that you both do something slightly different. Well, that's that's a corporate water company for you. Your own brand and identity. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we we, um, we we prefer to go down the route of not having prescriptive lists, leaving it open for the farmer to come to us. Um, yeah. So it's open to all innovation, all ideas from the farmers. The farmers know their farms best. They know how best to improve them. Uh, and so we, we like to leave it as an open door for ideas. 